This young man looks nothing out of the ordinary, right? Well, as we all know, you can't always judge a book by its cover. After an extensive history of antisocial and violent behavior, this young teen committed his first murder at the age of just 15, claiming the lives of his first victims. However, the worst things he did to their bodies were far from over. As authorities would soon find out, he not only killed, but brutally tortured his victims. Hello strangers and strangelings, welcome back to the Strange Bar and Grill. I'm serving up another true crime story time. Right now I'm just drinking on some unbranded beer because it puts me right where I need to be to tell these wild true crime stories. So pull up a chair if you like strange true crime and storytelling, then this is the place to be. Here with me, JP. Remember, I've been drinking, but I ain't been driving. Alright, let's go. I want to hurt people. Daniel Marsh was born on the 14th of May, 1997, in the little town of Davis, California. There he had a relatively normal childhood for the most part. Daniel was hailed as a child hero at the age of 10 when he used CPR to save his father who was having a heart attack. His heroic act made the headlines in 2008 and even earned him an American Red Cross Heroes Award. Things took a downward turn later that year when his parents went through a brutal divorce due to his mother's extramarital affairs with his kindergarten teacher. I guess Daniel just really, really needed to get that A, so I guess his mom had to give his teacher a piece of her A. This divorce marked the beginning of Daniel's homicidal tendencies as he recalled having a strong desire to kill the woman who caused his parents' breakup. Those thoughts got much worse, so much so that by the age 11, young Daniel was already expressing the desire to torture and kill people other than his mother's new girlfriend. At this age, he was diagnosed with adjustment disorder and depression. To his parents, that was all it was a depressed child having issues adjusting to his parents' divorce. But they were wrong. At 13 years old, Daniel began seeing a clinical social worker because he was having anger outbursts, bad nightmares, and was generally not liking other people. He was prescribed antidepressants to help control his mood and temper, but they did very little to curb his developing psychopathic tendencies. It wasn't long until young Daniel started using alcohol and marijuana, which only seemed to worsen his temper and intensify his twisted desires to kill anything with a pulse. His alcohol use got so bad that his father threw him out of the house at the age of 14, and when he moved in with his mother, his alcohol use gave way to anorexia. His eating disorder got so critical that he had to be admitted to the hospital for well over a month. For the next year or so, he was put on different medication, from antipsychotics to antidepressants. But it appears the drugs weren't doing much. In fact, his doctors reported that Marsh was having psychotic episodes almost daily. But for some reason, he was still released and allowed to go home. Daniel's violent thoughts and dreams of killing people only got worse, and by December of 2012, he told his school counselor about his burning desire to kill people. As a result, the police were involved, and Daniel was involuntarily committed to a mental facility because of the potential threat he posed to others and himself. He was put on another batch of antipsychotics, and by early 2013, he was re-released. But then again, in January of 2013, Daniel told his school psychologist of the reoccurring homicidal thoughts he was having, and this time, they were directed at his classmates. During the conversation with Daniel, the psychologist asked if he would ever act on those thoughts and he answered boldly, I have full confidence that I could hurt these people. He went on to describe in full detail about how he really wanted to torture people by cutting out their eyes and peeling off their skin from their flesh. Daniel added that these thoughts only scratched the surface of the things he wanted to do to people. A police officer was brought in to assess the situation of Daniel's claims, but it was ultimately determined that Daniel posed no danger to himself or others because they believed there was no intent or intended victim. What the fuck? Really? He straight up telling people he wants to kill them and do harm to others. And they're just like, hey, sleep it off, bro. 
You need a glass of water? Can I get you a snack or something? Daniel's homicidal tendencies and thoughts got more profound to the point that when he looked at a person, all he could think about was the best way to kill them. He had dreams and often fantasized about school massacres and his passion was really to become a serial killer. While other 14 year olds were dreaming of getting through high school, Daniel was fantasizing about becoming a serial killer. He was reportedly obsessed with famous serial killers like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer. Thinking about killing people is one thing, but Daniel got so bold that he even began telling his friends about how he would torture and kill random people if he could. At some point, he allegedly made a very detailed plan on how he would torture and kill his girlfriend's ex-boyfriend. He would often draw violent and graphically detailed paintings in art class. Paintings that would depict gruesome murder scenes with obscene details of the method of killing. Some of his friends recall him talking about how if he ever got around to killing anyone and was arrested, he would just claim insanity. At the start of 2012, Daniel had found a way to feed his twisted fantasies by joining an online community called bestgore.com, a site that featured gore, pornography, and graphic details, and real-life gory scenes and events. He then graduated from paintings and online communities to starting fires and engaging in animal cruelty. Marsh was frequently seen brutally abusing animals. He went from strangling stray cats and raccoons to attempting to kill his friend's dog. And at some point, when asked why he did what he did, he would typically answer by saying he did it because he felt like it. The violent streak continued to escalate to the point where he was ready to perform these heinous acts on people. During his confession, Daniel revealed that after years of homicidal thoughts and fantasies, he had enough and decided that at the age of 15, he was going to live out his dreams and actually kill someone, proving that he was never an impulsive person. Daniel took his time in planning out the murders by making sure he wasn't going to be caught. He wore an all-black outfit, taped the bottoms of his shoes to avoid leaving footprints, and wore gloves to keep from leaving DNA or fingerprints. His weapon of choice was a six inch knife that he took from his mother's kitchen. Daniel crept out of his mother's apartment at 2 a.m. and began searching for a victim. According to his own confession, he checked more than 40 homes for an open window before finally spotting one at Northup's and Mopin's home, which was only two blocks from his father's house. Oliver Northup, 84 years old, was a Navy veteran who graduated from UCLA and worked as an attorney till his gruesome death at the hands of Daniel. His wife, Claudia Mopin, 76 years old, was a stage actress at the local theater as well as a pastoral assistant at the Davis Unitarian Church. The couple were married for 47 years and had 11 children, some of whom were from previous marriages. They also had 14 grandchildren and several great-grandchildren. Daniel gained entry into the old couple's home by slicing open the screen on the window and climbing into the house. He waited in the living room before hearing snores coming from the bedroom. Following the snore sounds, he made his way into the bedroom where he found the old couple sleeping. And for a few minutes, Daniel stood beside the bed watching the couple sleep, trying to decide from the number of ways he wanted to kill them. According to his confession, at that moment, standing over the couple's bed, he felt nervous, but also excited and exhilarated. Unfortunately, this was when Claudia woke up to see a strange boy in their bedroom, and she began screaming. Alarmed by her scream, Daniel started stabbing the 76-year-old woman in her torso multiple times as she screamed and begged for him to stop. He would later reveal during his confession that her cries for him to stop only incentivized him to keep stabbing her. In his own words, he said, the old lady just would not die. And that was when her husband, Oliver, woke up. Daniel proceeded to stab the 84-year-old man many times until he was confident that the man was dead. He would later reveal that he didn't stop after the couple was dead, but continued to stab the lifeless bodies because it just felt right. Daniel inflicted 67 stab wounds all over Claudia's body, including several in her face some of which knocked out her teeth. Oliver was stabbed 61 times, stretching all the way from his head down to his feet. Daniel didn't stop after he murdered the couple. Apparently, 
death was not the end. Instead, he went on to mutilate their bodies even further. The 15-year-olds cut open the deceased bodies of the couple to examine and experiment on them. He cut open Claudia's leg and torso, disemboweling her by pulling fat out of both areas. He also tried to cut out her eyes, but apparently that proved too difficult. He then cut open Oliver, taking out his internal organs and cutting open his forehead out of sheer curiosity. He then placed a cell phone into Claudia's abdomen and a drinking glass into Oliver's torso. When asked during interrogation why he did this, he simply said it was to f with the people who would later investigate the murders. What a sick, twisted mother f After he finished up with the couple, Marsh wandered down the streets looking for more victims, but he couldn't find any at the time. He kept souvenirs from the attack, like the knife he used in the killing of the couple and the bloody clothes he wore. He would later go on different occasions in search of more victims, and this time he armed himself with the baseball bat instead. He revealed that his choice to change weapons was so that his subsequent murder wouldn't be connected to the stabbing of the old people. Apparently, he studied serial killers and having an M.O. was always how they were caught. The morning following the attack on April 14th, Oliver and Claudia were absent from church service, which of course raised concerns with their family. Oliver's daughter Mary attempted to reach the couple by calling their cell phones, but to no avail. When Oliver failed to show up for a gig he had with his local folk band, his son Robert decided to visit the couple at home, but upon getting to the house, he left thinking the couple was out of town. In the end, it was Claudia's daughter Laura who went into the house with the police this time to check out the situation later that evening. Upon searching around the house, Laura found the slashed screen with the window open and she could see blood stains all over the house. The police made a forced entry only to discover the horrific scene of blood and guts spread all over the bedroom. The investigation sparked national interest with over 25 FBI agents and numerous investigators crawling into the small town to try and solve the gruesome murders. But seeing how careful Daniel was in not leaving any physical evidence like fingerprints or DNA behind, the investigation soon reached a dead end. But Daniel would eventually be arrested only because he couldn't stop himself from bragging about the murders. In the days following the murder, Daniel bragged about the murder to his close friends at school and even told other students during his lunch break. Of course, they didn't believe him, but that didn't seem to bother him. He later went on to explain to his girlfriend how he committed the murders in graphic detail and was visibly smiling as he did so. Daniel would later tell a close friend about the murders again, but this time showing his friend the items he used during the attack, like the knife, the gloves, and the bloody clothes. Describing the attack, as the best experience of his life. Daniel's friend and his girlfriend talked about his confession to the attacks and after inquiring about the murders, found that it was shockingly true. Neither of them initially reported the crime because they were scared of him. They told Daniel's father about it, hoping he would do something about it, but he didn't believe them. Daniel's friend ended up reporting it to the police after Daniel told him he was planning another attack on June 17th, Daniel was arrested. On the 17th of June, 2013, Daniel was brought into the principal's office to be questioned by FBI Special Agent Chris Campion and Detective Ariel Panita of the Davis Police Department. At the start of the interrogation, Daniel initially denied any involvement in the murders. He was sobbing and begging the detectives to believe him, but after three and a half hours of interrogation, he finally confessed, stating, That night, I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to do it. I lost control. He explained in detail the entire crime. I went to their bedroom. I opened the door. Then I just kind of stood there over their bed watching them sleep for a few minutes. My body was trembling. I was nervous, but just, just so excited and exhilarated. I was actually going to do it. I was there. It was finally happening. He further described how he mutilated the couple, stating, I cut open both of their torsos, you know, around here. And then he kind of points to two areas of his chest. And in the woman, I put a phone inside of her and I put a cup inside the guy. During the interrogation, Daniel admitted that 
it was the best feeling in his life, stating, it was pure happiness and adrenaline and dopamine, just all of it rushing over me. I'm not gonna lie, it felt amazing. It was the most exhilarating, enjoyable feeling I've ever felt. He further explained that the positive feeling he felt while stabbing the couple was better than sex, and it lasted for weeks after the attack. He told the detective, I don't feel sympathy for other people at all. I don't feel empathy for them. In a bid to see things from Daniel's perspective, Special Agent Campion asked Daniel how he would go about killing him, since he had thought about killing anyone he ever met. Daniel answered point blank without hesitation, just a lot of ways, choking you to death with your tie, beating your face into the mirror until it broke, and using the glass to cut out your arteries, gouging your eyes out and just smashing your face into the wall. Nothing personal, and without being asked, Daniel told detectives where he stashed the items used in committing the murders and that he had kept them as souvenirs. Daniel William Marsh was convicted of two counts of premeditated murder and was sentenced to 52 years to life imprisonment. He tried to appeal by pleading insanity, but a jury found him sane and dismissed the appeal. However, the California State Legislature passed Senate Bill 260 in 2013, which allowed juvenile offenders to seek parole after 20 or 25 years. This bill enabled Daniel to be eligible for parole after serving 25 years to his sentence. Do not let this man out. Do not let this man out in 20, 25 years. Dude's a sicko, he's gonna do it again. Mark my words. Another bill, Proposition 57, which was passed in 2016, allowed juvenile court judges to decide if minors would be tried as an adult or in juvenile court. This law allowed for Marsh to appeal his case with the possibility of early release if a judge allowed it. The appeal was denied, and Daniel remained in the adult prison system to serve out his complete sentence. I usually don't hope for people to get assaulted. Night, night, keep your butthole tight. Daniel had another hope for early release when Governor Jerry Brown passed Senate Bill 1391 in 2018. The bill prevented minors under 16 from being tried or convicted as adults, regardless of the nature of crime. Daniel's attorney saw an opening and appealed that the new law should apply to him as well. The appeal was brought before a district court where, if granted, Daniel would be released upon turning 25 in 2022. The case was dragged out in court for almost two years before it was finally dismissed in September of 2021, and Daniel remains in prison to serve out his full sentence. Cheers to that. Alright guys, that's going to be it for today. If you like that story, then leave a comment or a like. And if you're new to my channel, then maybe consider subscribing and joining that SBG family. And remember, I've been drinking, but I ain't been driving. So until next time, be good, be safe, 